what was it? Like Sinatra tells a story about he used to study Bing Crosby, not to how he sang, but because he got very rich and successful. Well, what was the original intent of putting this band together? Where'd you think you were going to go? I think it was a lot, obviously quite a lot of things in the intent. But it did have quite... Um, it did have an intention. I, mean, I can imagine forming a band and not having... Not really having an intention apart from having a laugh or making money or trying to do it weekends. I can imagine that that would be the intention of a lot of bands um, and could well have been the intention of this one. It, it really wasn't. I think that all the people, the main people here that formed the band, which is uh, Brian, Keith, myself and Stu, Charlie came later and though very integral did come later though he got imbued with that spirit but the original intention um, was really to to make a band that was going to play rhythm and blues music but of uh, with the largest kind of dimensions of that whatever that term really means and of course, everyone spent hours discussing what it really means because the age one seems to have time to do that. Um, uh, and not be uh, um, constricted in that term by, um, by other people's definitions and so on. Because there were these other bands that were formed out of traditional jazz going around, particularly, say, Alexis Corner at that time. I don't, you know what yeah, that is. And, and they seemed to play, you know, one kind of thing and they would not admit to others. I mean, they would say, yes, well, we can play Howling Wolf, but we can't play Bo Diddley, and we can play this Muddy Waters, but we can't play Jimmy Reed, and so on and so on. So we said, well, you know, we don't really agree with you. And also, we, we all like rock and roll as well. So even though we call ourselves a room and blues band, at rehearsals we would do everything from Elvis Presley and Buddy Holly and Richie Valens and everything. But the actual intent of the band was to, was to be a, a young band that would play what we, what we consider our favourite kind of rhythm and blues music without too much of a rigid definition. But having said that, we were all terrific purists because there's always more than one person in a band, so that's what makes a band interesting about the different kinds of musical tastes. Um, I mean, Keith and myself, for instance, were really like to sort of play more rock and roll music, say, than Brian. Brian was perhaps of a different bent in the blues. I mean, he particularly liked Elmore James and so on. He, he and he learnt to play in that style. And I'm not saying we didn't like that, but I don't think we would have played it if it hadn't been for Brian and, um, and so on. So that was really the intent of the band. It was not really a band... Um, formed to make money. In fact, we, we never thought we would ever make money because it was such an uncommercial thing um, to do. The bands make, making money at that time were would play in ballrooms and uh, um, would play, have to play cover versions of Top 20 hits. All we were doing was playing cover versions of Top 20 R&B hits, but, I mean, we didn't really think about that at the time. How about image? How calculated was it and how real was it? We're talking about the very beginning now. I don't want to go to, like, 1965. And yes, yes. There's a I lot happened. In the very beginning, before we made a record, yeah. before we'd signed any contracts with management or something, uh, we, I didn't have any idea of any image at all. I didn't even... It didn't cross my mind. It... Uh, it may well have crossed someone, crossed someone like Brian's mind, but he, it never was brought up. That first time I remember talking about anything that could be remotely connected with image was um, was when I was wearing sort of some kind of layered look at one of these clubs, and I was and I was. Uh, they said it, Brian, Brian, I think Brian and Keith. They said it was it was too effeminate. I was, well, I didn't quite understand why I couldn't be as feminine or whatever I wanted. I, I'd obviously not thought about it. I think that Keith and Brian had more than I had. But it wasn't spoken of. Yeah. Well, later when it came along, well, was to decide to be the bad boys, to decide to be the whatever the Rolling Stones represented, 64, 65. Yeah. Was that calculated? Uh, and, and it was calculated and, very much by Andrew Oldham. Right. Um and lived up to to a certain extent. Um, 
it's very easy to manipulate the press in this country, um, especially if you've got something they're interested in. And it's very easy to manipulate uh, that kind of image rather than anything else because it's so e it's just so easy to do. But then you get caught up with it and so on. Did you enjoy it? Yeah. Um, I think to a certain extent, but it's it's always a dull to be to be labelled with in one particular way because every person has more than one facet. So that um, Brian, for instance, really got fed up with the idea that he'd been labelled dirty because he was quite like to be thought of as being clean. So he got very upset about about it. So that you see, then you start to get that that rebellion against, hey, wait a minute, I'm not just some dirty guy that goes around hitting old ladies on the head. I'm not really like that. I'm sorry. That that's, that's how I've been painted. And it's very hard to get rid of that. I, I say even now, you know, you get this... There's this satirical programme on um, British television called Spitting Image, which I don't know if you've seen. But, it, yeah. But so... Um, this is... So to go from then to now, 20 years later or more, and then... One month, they, you know, um, they they had portrayed me as a sort of real coke sniffer, sniffing junkie for like months, and then, then my brother knows the people that did it, and they said, you know, mixed really thing is out of date. So I went from in one week from being at that to being, um, all I'm interested in is children. So now I'm not. Ca so because the truth is never really any either of those things. <laughs> Where are you going? Oh, there. Okay. See you in a minute. Thank you again. How much, how much input did, uh, did Andrew Oldham have overall, I mean, musically and... Uh, musically, almost nothing. I mean, I'd say... He, he, yeah. No, that's not true. I'd, uh, that's not one of those terrible things to say. He can glass people. He did. He had a terrific influence, but the influence was already there. I think that Andrew Oldham uh, encouraged the band to become more pop-orientated, away from the blues, away from the, the original rhythm and blues stance, because he never could have done that if the band hadn't... Um, wanted to go that way. Um, both Keith and Brian were very much influenced by the Beatles and so on, and everyone was at that point. Though I must say, I, I never, I don't think I was as much as they were. I mean, one envied the success and so on, but I never really liked the, the music as much. But Keith kind of absorbed it, and I think it helped him in his songwriting and song structure and so on. When you were doing the blues things early on, you're just this what if. What if you got in the hands of a Tom Dowd or a Jerry Wexler or a... Or a yeah, we, it, it should have really happened like that, but of course it didn't. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, they, we were there. They could have easily have, yeah. have come up. I mean, we started recording in Chicago um, very early on. Um, and so we went that route. Um, to, um, I mean, it was being produced by the engineer at Chess, really. And that was our first experience of a decent sound. Then we went to RCA and we were produced by the engineer there called Dave Hassinger, which is like the satisfaction and all stuff like that. So that was very good of its kind. And in a way, that's perhaps better than if we'd have gone with the guys that you mentioned, we would have become like two orientating one sort of music, yeah. the whole... Muscle in, shows. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we did that anyway one time, with brown sugar and all that, we did that. But, it, but um, um, I mean, in a way, it's good that we went that route because we were more independent. We, we were more um, eclectic, I suppose. I hate to use overused word, but, you know, rather than just doing one kind of music. When, when it happened, when you got successful, what was the reaction of this band? Glee. Yeah. I mean, no, I think it's just, you know, it's a wonderful thing to be young and successful. Um, what was the yeah. chemistry inside this, uh, this band, too, uh, with success? Well, I think, you know, it, it's it definitely... I mean, it was great fun and everything, but I think it, it quickly evaporates, and I think you become sort of silly on it, really. It's like a permanent high. Being successful, and um, I mean the, the the music. I mean, I, 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 all this is very very quickly said and everything. And I, I, I'm, I, I, it's the trouble is it's not very thought out. But I think that the, um, I think you all the the early uh, 
sort of dedication song goes out of the window when you get success on this level. And um, you become less interested in what you're doing musically as, you know, where your records are on the charts and, um, you know, is it number one and um, how many you've sold. And we used to get on stage and, you know, play a few minutes and girls would run the stage. That would be the end of the gig. You know, we never... There was a long period from like 1964 or 5 to 1967 where we never really played on stage a proper gig the whole time and I think that was very frustrating plus the whole thing of sound wasn't together I mean the sound equipment wasn't what it is now and um, you just went on and played these silly gigs in the, you know any promoter could cook up a gig somewhere in a big place, and that they wouldn't have any sound equipment, wouldn't have any anything together, and hopefully you'd fill it up. But then, then we wouldn't. We'd play your stuff, but we, you know you couldn't hear. There wouldn't be proper PA and so on. So that was pretty frustrating that period musically. I felt the stuff that came in the studio was alright, but the stuff that we played at gigs was a bit sus. I think. How competitive were you with, uh, with the Beatles and with others? I think it was very competitive. I mean, I think it still is competitive. It's a very Competitive business. But well, you um, talk about a, you were in a tight little business. Yeah, it's a tight yeah. little group. Yeah. And, and as far as that, I don't think it's changed a lot. You know, the, you've got this um, group of people, especially in England. I mean, I, I mean, obviously, I live a lot of time in America. I mean, I, yeah. I'm not sort of stranger there, but it seems with this tight group of English people who very much know each other's think going on and. Um, there's a competitiveness but there's a, also a friendliness as well and an exchange of ideas and did, I think did that, that was, exist with, oh with yeah, the Stones very and, much. and the Beatles yeah. Yeah. yeah it was very much an exchange of ideas and people would be listening to someone's new record and saying wow that was good well, you know, what can we what can we use of that really it was very much like that however maybe conscious and different levels but looking back on it I'm sure it was very much like that there was a terrific community here then. I oh, yeah. Really very, very much. Yeah, it was a very good community. And, um, I mean, that I find that there still is a tremendous sense of community in, in this country as far as music goes. And I'm very... I, I'm still having a very good time within that community because they... It, 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 I mean, it still seems in a way the, the, a similar sort of thing. Back at that time, the image almost took over for the band. The, uh, the, the uproar, the corruptors of youth, yeah, all that. the anarchists, the uh, rebellion against yeah. the authority. Yeah. Uh, there was a perception of you in the States that didn't exist here in the U.S., did it? Uh, uh, in the States, it didn't exist here. In, in the oh, yeah, it existed here, too. Yeah. It was a sort of international thing. And, um, yeah, that... Um, Well, I don't know. I really be sensitive to that kind of criticism. I can't really put myself back in that, that period at all. I mean, it would take me hours to get back into that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're right. There was a, there was all that, and it, beca- I, it was really boring, and it culminated in a whole drug bust and everything, and um, and which wasn't much fun, and, and so the the ultimate thing of that is that. Uh, you know, you were manipulating the media who were in turn manipulating you and so on. And I, don't, I didn't really enjoy that very much. That dark period. That was, uh, well, you know, it was very false and, yeah. and uh, of course, it wasn't true and there was elements of truth in it, but there were just just elements, really. I mean, people get played up to. I mean, look what happened to Brian. I mean, it, it kind of obviously got to him. He didn't like it, couldn't live with it. Um... I mean, the band became a lot... I mean, it, it just became very, very sad, I think, with Brian. And then eventually Keith, I think, must have suffered from it. I don't know. It's difficult. I mean, I don't really want to speak for it. You were able to distance else. yourself uh, from... Well, the, not completely, you know, but I, was, I, I wasn't able... No, I wasn't able to distance myself. I'm not going to say I was outside of that at all. I, I, I found it all a bit... It wasn't really what the band had set out to do. It had nothing to do with it. And I think from the that's what success does to you. That it that it, you know, the the band's original intention as as you asked me was very simple. And um 
then that got so twisted in five years by everything that happened. The slippery road of success. I mean, and then it, then the, it, the, the sort of it's sort of endless more really that the the, the um, publicity machine and so on and on the road and and of course people do do outrageous. Every band did outrageous things on the road and. But you know the stuff that we did was really singled out because um, that was you know it's selective. That's what I said to you about that TV program. It's like what well what, yeah whatever you want you know it's selective. I mean we did uh, you know we used to do stupid do goody things as well like go around hospitals you know like looking at sick children. But <laughs> I mean it was uh, I, that was not what I really set out to do. But I mean there you are you're and then. Especially in this country, that kind of whole showbiz thing is such a sort of small little world and you're expected to be part of it. And if you don't become part of it and join the variety club and the charity and do this and that, then you're you know, some kind of weirdo. And um, that wasn't what I set out to do. And I, I really don't like doing that now. And I don't, I don't really think I'm part of it now. And um, I wasn't part of it then. And I think there's a lot of time wasted of this band with that um, with all that image stuff and eventually of course I, I think it contributed to Brian um, just sort of cracking up completely and um, I think much to a certain extent Keith great, becoming a junkie you guys had to be the most dissected most analysed Oh, you know, and I started to do a little reading, a little yeah. research. There's, my God, there's tons of it. Do, do, does, do you ever react to any of that at all? No, I think... <laughs> I just ignore it. Yeah. Um, I don't read them. I've never read... I've read bits, I must admit, I've read bits. I've never read a book about Rolling Stones cover to cover. Or about myself. Um, but there's a tremendous lot of them. Oh, there's, and there's loads. such scholarly treatises, you know. You uh, and know. such garbage yeah. ones, yes, too. That's what, <laughs> <laughs> I once asked Van Morrison, you know, they used to write about Van Morrison's lyrics with yeah. bringing such myths. And I said, what about that? He says, that's a trip, man, you know, I mean, it's yeah. nothing to do with me. <laughs> but uh, Jesus, this band, they're Chris guy, the writers, all the writers. Yeah, the well, they'd have all that. Ah, well, that's their business, yeah. though. I mean, we're talking about, I mean, the business of writers like Chris Gow and the business, I mean, all that started with the, the Rolling Stone magazine, I think, it started around then in San Francisco, and um, yeah, what can I tell you? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't. I, I think. Well, it's fine if that's what they want to do. Then, then let's let them do it. Um, I mean, so there are there's sometimes. There, I'm not saying that there are not intelligent reviews. I mean, there was one review on the last Stones album, Dirty Work album. There was like two reviews, which really was very clever, because I'd read all these reviews. Some were quite good, but it completely misunderstood everything that was going on. And I think Chris Gow and one guy here had a really good review, which really understood it. I mean, it's nice when you write lyrics, for instance. I mean, and music too. And then a guy actually reviews it and understands what it's about. It's quite nice because it's so rare. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I thought it was really quite intelligent because it, I'd written something which was really a little bit muddy, you know, it wasn't supposed to be clear. And the guy really understood it and I mean, was quite gratified. That's going to be terrific, isn't it? It's nice, man, especially when you've read, like, some reviews where they say, oh, this song was about this and something like that. It wasn't really anything to do, you know, it was supposed to be. Another sexist song that was about, you know... Um, something else and and it was nice it was good and I'm saying I'm not totally anti-review just gonna get a cup of tea sure. there is more stuff written much of which is is got to be garbage because it yeah. is off into the mystic and it, yeah it's like, no I five mean five guys came down from uh, another planet yeah, exactly. and existed here you know, that's, <laughs> yeah no, it's really funny and um, <laughs> there's quite a little like, cottage industry yeah. I mean some of them have sold reasonably well some Nothing. Um, well, when I talk, you know, when you talk about the fifties, and I was a disc jockey. There was no such press. There was no such press for Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley no. or Richard. There, there no, they were just. Yeah. It was just sort of yeah. in those days. Yeah, oh, it was just like fan stuff, yeah. wasn't it? Fan magazine. Was um, yeah, there. when I when I first take take started taking music papers, it was 
even the record reviews were always favourable. Oh yeah, but <laughs> they didn't print the ones they didn't like. No, or if they did, you know, there was always like just said nice things. They never compared it to anything else, or said it was fast, even or slow. They just reviewed it in that funny way. Billboard just review records like that, and um, then I, I think that all changed in the kind of, as I said before, in the kind of advent of magazines like Rolling Stone. Of course, the, the serious papers here. Uh, during the early 60s were lionising the Beatles to a large extent and then they would, you know then they start, you know, serious journalists realised that people would read it so that, you know, it gave I'm really cynical about journalists because, I mean, it just I think it just gave them another subject to write about which they hadn't considered and said, oh wow, people actually read this garbage, okay I write this crap, you know, for the Times and so on, for the Guardian, and um, I mean, these people are still writing. I mean, I know quite a lot of them, kind of friends of mine, but they started, you know, when they were in the early twenties. They probably reviewed films and things or books, and they realised that they that they could get to review pop music also, which they liked it. So you know, before it wasn't possible. What was your perception of the band as you hit the seventies? become an institution and... No, it didn't happen really like that. It, 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 um, 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 well, the usual cliche is, of course, the 60s never really ended until later on in the 70s. And, I mean, uh, up until uh, 1972, because the band then, we left living in the UK, but I mean, I, I start to remember that the album like Exile on Main Street is being very much done in France, but also done in the United States, and then we went on a tour, America and so on. Then after that, things start to go kind of a little bit wrong, I think. And um, I think we all became complacent and so on. There was good things produced, but uh, that's just my feeling of it now, that I think the band sort of after 1972, kind of got a little bit. I don't know. Maybe they just thought, well, fuck it. You know, we've done it, or we still tried, but I don't think the results were that wonderful. How about the music? Do you compare the music from pre-72 and post-72? Well, that's what I was trying yeah, to do. I mean, I don't think that I don't have a discography in front of me. I do have one upstairs. Yeah. That might be helpful. But I, I was looking at it yesterday, and. Um, I, I can't remember it. I, mean, I can't remember the album after yeah. Exile. Most I don't know what it is. They all go into. There was Goat's Head Soup. Yeah, that's a post. Uh, yeah, that's the one after the, Exile. The Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic Records. But that's after Exile. Exile was on Atlantic. Exile was on there. That was that, that was the first one. Yeah. No, Steve Fiennes is before. Whatever. I the, the the comparison, but you felt that they weren't very good albums. Goat's. Let's yeah. put it down like that. Goat's Head Soup and um, it's only rock and roll. Yeah. Um, and Black and Blue there's only three and then the one after that was Some Girls but those three albums were not really the best stuff the Rolling Stones I'm not saying there wasn't good things on it I mean, maybe some people will like them you know there's a certain taste um, they were just certainly slightly different though and I don't know why that was in time. Did it, did it bother you guys at all that you weren't the same kind of factor I, I don't mean in selling records but was anybody a factor in those years in the seventies? No, it was a kind of odd period. I think, mate, wasn't it? Led Zeppelin was really big. I guess, then. yeah, but they. But they were funny bags. They never released singles, so that they yeah. they weren't really in the pop mainstream, so to speak. And they didn't have the same kind of impact on on people that uh, that you guys and the Beatles and some others did in the uh, yeah in, in the sixties. So, but it, did it bother you at all? I mean, you were selling a ton of records, so it couldn't bother you too much. But well, you know, I don't think the record yeah. sales were that wonderful. Yeah. I mean, they were good, but I don't think they were that great. Um, and there wasn't very many tours in that period. There was there were only two. So I think generally the band sort of suffered from a bit of a malaise in that period. Just as an aside, how did, how did, what was your working? How did, who sent out the call that, uh, let's get together? All you guys seem to be all over the world. Uh, yeah. How did it work that you decided it's time? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, just like... Anyone else? You just say, well, you know, we, I mean, we, we normally just make a record every year and we get together every year and do it. 
and we'd say we're going to do it in this studio and we'd be there. You and Keith have to spend a lot of time writing? and Yeah, and we'd say, okay, we're going to do this in Germany and we'd go, oh, we're going to do this whenever we did them. We did that in Jamaica, Goat's Head Soup. And we, go, went, we all went to Jamaica, as simple as that, nothing complicated in it. How, how'd you manage to avoid, uh, over all these years, the, the problems that every other group had? I mean, you, in longevity, there's nothing even close. Well, there were a lot of problems in this yeah, period. Always problems, but here you're still there. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I don't know. I think uh, um, that everyone had kind of just considered that they were going to pull their nose down and just stick with the band. I mean, there have been ideas of doing things on on our own. Bill, Bill started to do records on I think Mick Taylor did other things and so on. But, I mean, I think we were just generally very lazy as well. But it never got, the tensions never got unbearable like they did with the Eagles or like they did with... No. I mean, I'd, you know, I don't know how, what sort of book this is. I don't want to start really telling what... I can't even remember. No, no. But, I mean, it, I think that... I mean, on the nice side, I think the band had... that, that we decided that we were going to definitely stick together for this period... For instance, we'd signed this big contract with Atlantic and so on. We were quite happy with it. We were quite happy with being in a band. We had no other ambitions. That they, that the, that the band had no other ambitions really than to do what they were doing. And um, and as, as I said, that's that's fine. That was a good um, thing to, to 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 be thinking of. But on the other hand, I think also it must be said during that period that perhaps the band became a bit complacent. We were accused of being that by critics, which we didn't... I didn't agree with at the time, but looking back on it, I think the, the, the output and everything and all that, I, I think we could be accused of being complacent in that period, and that's why... If you're doing quite well, you're just coasting. You know how that is in life. And, and, you, and you just coast along. And I think that's what we were doing. It's difficult to recall exactly what the... Feeling. I find what's difficult and don't recall the past is not the facts, but actually how you felt at the time is so difficult. But I think that's what we were doing. What got you back on track again? Get, being bored with being complacent. <laughs> being complacent about being complacent. Yes, complacent. <laughs> and you say, wow, maybe we are. You know? I don't think the records were doing that well. They were doing... Yeah. Okay. They were coasting. You know, you couldn't really say... Well, that was a flop. You know, you had number one records occasionally, and you have top ten singles and so on. So you can't really be accused of totally... When you have a top ten record, I mean, you think how many records are coming out, you're all making top ten records. You say, hey, that was a top ten record. What, are you gonna, what do you want? You know? But I think... And then we suddenly got another burst of, of energy, and Keith was trying to clean up and so on. And, um, I don't know, um, that's just... Ronnie creative Wood, yeah. energy. I mean, Ronnie Wood had joined in 1970, whatever it was, five or something. And um, we had some problems with personnel at that period. And then um, we uh, went that album, Some Girls, which was a big success. I mean, I don't know why we made that record at that period. and what It, was a, it is, I mean, a very good album. I mean, there you go. How about you, uh the, the physical demands, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are out on stage a lot, but you're not on stage, you're jumping all over. What what kind of preparation, what kind of cost is that to you? Well, I never made any preparations at all until, like, 1978, when I decided that I was getting old. Mm -hmm. I had to prepare, but I enjoyed all the preparations. Um, the stages were getting bigger. I'm going to find this picture if we could transcribe the toast, but I got the... <laughs> Um, and um, the stages were getting bigger and uh, I was more into doing the shows and so we were more in control and I just felt I should do some sort of preparation to be honest that was minimal the only time I ever really did a lot of preparation physically was 1981 and that was the only time because we had such a big stage and I felt that you know I really wanted to be really on form and I wanted to see how far I could push myself and it's amazing how much punishment the body will take. Um, I mean, you can lose sight of the thing of the, you know, I should maybe have spent more time singing, but 
you know, there you go. What would happen on nights that you you couldn't? You should probably especially get it up, but you couldn't get going. You you couldn't just stand there and sing. Did you make it every night? Uh, yeah, more or less. Yeah. I would make it every night. I mean, you know, I mean, lots of people don't move around much on stage at all. I mean, even young bands, like you take. I mean, it's amazing how little work they do. The only guy that I think I really think works very hard that I've seen at the moment, young, is Paul Young. I mean, I went to see this band called In Excess from Australia last week. I mean, that, that's an OK band. It's very much like a version of the Rolling Stones, but not as good. But um, the guy is good, the singer, and he looks real great, but he doesn't really move. I mean, he can't be spending much energy. He can't be really tired when he comes off. I can't believe he can be at sort of 23. He must be able just to sit there and, like, well, be recovered in three minutes. <laughs> you know, but there you go. Well, who cares? Uh... <laughs> Also, but you yourself, you lead such dual, such dual, well, more than dual lives. You're, uh, very social, very visible, and very rock and roll. Is is there any conflict? Is there? Uh, no, but no one Amateur, else does it. Only you and Ahmed Erdogan can, can do it. Can, you're an avid reader. You're you're interested in business. There's, there's some of these people in rock and roll who light up a room by leaving it sometime. I mean, uh, are they? Yeah, uh, lots of rock and roll people are really boring. Yeah. Lots of musicians are dull as hell. But, I mean, they're duller than accountants, I mean. But, um, no, I mean, it's just... Um, I don't know, it's nice in a way. I, I enjoy... Um, I don't find it conflicting. When I, when I want to do music, I want to do just that. I think you've got to really concentrate on it. And, like... Uh, I love to, to meet all kinds of different people and so on, and, you know, there is a kind of... You can go over the top in that area, like, I, I don't think Ahmed does sometimes, but... I mean, I, I enjoy um, socialising, meeting people. If I don't enjoy it, I just leave. I don't find that as a conflict. I sometimes feel a bit lonely in a large group of people because there's no-one else from entertainment industry there, and, you, you know, you... But I guess, you know, I'm, there's not a lot of rock singers that do that. That mix in that, I know that group. David Bowie is the only other one, so I suppose that's why we're kind of friends because we obviously have a um, that kind of rapport. We enjoy that, and a lot of it's, it's social climbing, you know, and really in a way. But you know, it's kind of fun to meet different people rather than just meeting the same people you're with in the studio all the time. I agree with you totally. I mean, because I've had a civilian life, a yeah, the music life. Exactly. It just it, does it, it. It hasn't impacted you, obviously. When you, when you say when you do music, I can use it, you know, as well, because you see a lot. I mean, I am a writer, really. It's one of my prime roles, really. Is but, and I haven't done a lot of work on stage recently. Um, I mean, I suppose I see myself primarily as a writer, performer, and a singer. Um, so that when I'm, you know, when I'm around, I just, I really try and take in everything. You, that you, you, I think when you're a writer, you subconsciously use everything. To, to, so you know, if you're around rich people, you 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 thinking of, and you, I sometimes jot things down that I see, on you around like, the streets and so on, which I think is, very important for a writer. Um, both musically and lyrically. I mean, I don't mean you have to go living with ghetto people, but just to be in the pub here. And when I was in Amsterdam, it's like to really just spend the whole night just l looking at that. And but it's touching. Yeah, and you, you just jot things down and stuff. Um, so all that goes into the work. It's not just separate, really. I mean, any, every writer is like that, I think. And so, it, so in a way, it all goes into the package. I mean, some people criticise, say, hey... What, what's he writing about this shit? You know, it sounds like he's been in New York or something all the time. Yeah, well, you know, that's what I experience. I'd rather write what I experience than write about, like, bullshit that I don't know about. What about your, the acting career? Why has it only been a couple of movies and <laughs> your name is mentioned for everything up to yeah, one, I know. including Rambo, but... Uh, <laughs> well, I didn't know. Movies are such a funny animal and really music oftentimes come first. I mean, yesterday I went to, the, for instance, I went to a meeting. It was a very big movie. It's costing $50 million. They want me to do the second role in it, second male role. And they want Jack Nicholson to play the lead role, and I like Jack very much, and I love to do it. But when's it going to be shot? It's going to be shot 
in November and December and January, three months. Now I've got another movie offer for January, which is I've been they've been trying to get the money for for years, which is much more interesting for me. It's not a Hollywood movie with no money. But on the other hand, I'm supposed to be in the studio. So what am I going to do? I can't do both movies. If I do one of the big movie, that means I won't be in the studio to make an album for next year. So I want to make another solo album. So I've got to start. Has this been the case for the last 15 years? You haven't done a picture for 15 no, years. No, I haven't done anything. <laughs> no, no, the, no. But no, the, usually, the, I mean, the, I'm getting more offers now for pictures than I was, because I don't know why. But, I mean, now I'm getting these offers, and now I want to go back and really do music. It's just odd. Most of the offers that you get for pictures, either pictures never get made. Do you, do you like the process of pictures? No. It's, it's, it's a bore. For you, it's got to be terrible. It's really boring for creative people. Yeah. But, um... You know, most of the pictures that you get offered don't get made. So you, 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 yeah. Yeah. there's no good. There's very few pictures. I mean, I've turned down major pictures that, have been, that I've turned down are very, very few and far between. I can, in fact, I can only think of two uh, even in the last few years. One was The Great Train Robbery, which was done by Sean Connery, which I should have done. Um, I don't know why I wasn't in a good mood that day. I just turned it down. And the other one was like Annie, which was a big flop. And I knew it was going to be a flop. And what was I going to do in that part of the... Um, the, I can't remember you know yeah, the, the, the guy the nasty guy the, the stepfather that's the only two I can think of now the rest I've been offered a lot of shit and they never get yeah. made so yeah. you know that's yeah. movies <laughs> you uh, take a, a rather expensive role in your own business operations that, yeah you enjoy that or that you trust people or? No. I mean there's really I think that you've got to be well I mean yeah I take I don't really do a lot of business, to be honest. I really don't. Otherwise, I'd be doing other business. If I was a business person, I'd be, I'd be like Richard Branson, and I'd have record shops and all that crap. I, I really don't want to know about that. I'm much too lazy. But your own business. Yeah. But my own things, I like to have a certain amount of control over, and touring and so on. I like to know what's going on. But I think that role is a bit overplayed in the press. I mean, I. I really don't well, take any remember, notice of day-to-day -day stuff. I remember Abe Summer telling me in the Dorchester Hotel about you're going in the other room and reading, I guess, with the Atlantic contract, reading every page. Or, or no, well, the lawyers have to talk about it. Yeah. What do people normally do? They just tell Abe Summer to sign anything they want? Hey, come on. I don't believe they do. No. I, I mean, I don't believe Probably that artists not. do that. Probably. You've got to know what, you, yeah. what you're promising to deliver. And, I mean, you've got to read... Um, I didn't read legal documents. I asked the lawyer to tell me what I'm promising. Because if I can't deliver, well, I'm not going to promise it. And I don't want him to come back to me and say three years later. That... But day-to-day -day business is boring. And you have to employ and trust people to do it. How, how hard is it to be Mick? Uh, what's involved? There's, there's a handful of you who uh, are visible internationally for a long period of time. What, what goes with the territory there? I mean, how, how, how do you mean? I mean? Your own life. Uh, are you conscious of the fact that you create a tension where you oh, yeah. enter a room? Right? Yeah, and all that. Yeah. There's, there's, there's Sinatra and there's yourself and maybe Barbara Streisand. Right? There's a handful of people. Uh, I don't really people. like all that part yeah. of it. I, I honestly don't. I can see, I don't know Frank Sinatra. I've never met him. I imagine he likes that. He does. I mean, he and he would come into a room with a group of people with a bodyguard or friends or people that work for him women or whatever and um, you know make a uh, make himself the centre of attention now I'm saying that without knowing the guy but I mean from what I've seen heard him so, uh, I really don't like doing that and I don't like going out with bodyguards and things I don't go out, I don't have bodyguards you can see I mean, you know I, and um, I don't um particularly enjoy being the centre of attention going to a room. I'd rather slide into a room and observe the room and then if I want to make some point I'll make it but I don't like people in show business that do that whole um, number because it's just saying here I am I'm really big and important um, I, I'd like to be like I don't particularly want to be noticed above anyone else um, I don't want to be less noticed than anyone else I mean, I don't want to be ignored and stuck in a corner <laughs> and not given a drink. But but on the other hand, I don't like to do it in that show-busy way. I don't like show business in that way. How about the uh, the restrictions on your own privacy, the ability to 
Yeah, well, I try and avoid. I try to a certain extent to avoid that, you know, um, dark ways of doing it. I, I mean, I, I was supposed to decide. I was trying to figure out a way. How am I going to go to this big? There's a big tight boxing match tomorrow. World heavyweight champion, this English guy, yeah, yeah. Frank Wins. Bruno. Yeah, Bruno was. I got like fourth row seats. Now, how am I going to go to that without making a lot of fuss? There's going to be millions of famous people there. I'm not going to be the only one, and all that. I know that. How am I going to go? And when am I? I'm going to wear a disguise, and, and I much prefer to do it like that. I'm not, maybe I'm going to wear a moustache and some silly clothes. I get away with a lot. Um, I mean, I, when I live in France, I'm living in France a lot. People don't really take much notice. They're not. They, I mean, they, you know, you're kind of popular and everything, but they don't give a shit. How about here in London? Here it's kind of odd because you come from here and you're expected to give a lot, you know, just to ordinary people on the street and you can't be... Ri- they don't like it if you have an attitude. You, you've got to be of them. Same in New York, really. Yeah. <clears throat> they expect you. They know that I live there a lot and, you know, around where I live, I just walk around and go to the store and stuff. They just say, hi, Mick, and, and they walk right by. They don't stop you and gape or anything. Same here. If I go to the pub here, the, the guy... The guys might just look. It's very nice on that level. You can't expect it always to be like that. But that's how I, I like it. You still feel a little bit, little bit like a local politician, though. And so far, you've got to be. You can't be just say fuck off, you know, because they really don't like that. You get really a lot of. You feel like, and sometimes you say, oh, "I'm not going to sign your autograph. I'm just talking." They can understand that, but if you're just standoffish and or snobby, or if people think that you've become above yourself acting a certain way then they pull you right back to earth so there you are <laughs> it's uh it's hard to do i'm not saying it's and, easy you are conscious of, of the impact that you yeah have on oh yeah you you, you, yeah. yes you are and and you do and but on the other hand if you're too conscious then you, you don't make an impact hey then you might be disappointed i'm not making an impact so big deal isn't that the idea you've been trying to do that you that you're trying to go to a restaurant, a bar, or pub, whatever it is, or just walking on the street, or just going to buy something at the store. You're going down to buy a newspaper. You don't want to make an impact. How does Frank Sinatra buy the, the Daily Express from this store? I don't know how he does it. How does Barbra Streisand? Do they wear fur coats? I mean, does, <laughs> does he go in a limo? Yeah, does he send people? But I mean, it's nice to walk down to the store because I can send people, but I won't see that cover of the magazine that I want, maybe, or maybe I've forgotten to get the New Yorker, and now it'll be on. The, on the stand, and there's no substitute for that. You know, if I'm going to go, yeah, I mean, I can send people out to buy clothes, and the clothes come back. But that's no substitute for me going to the store and seeing because the girl might have, she might not realise I really like that green shirt. How's he going to know? That's. I'm not saying you don't want to spend your whole time doing this stuff, and of course sometimes you want to do it. But it it is nice to be on the same level as other people. To, to do the same things as other people do, and there's, and you know, um, if you're going away for the country at the weekend, it's, there's a, a certain therapy in loading your own bags up and so on, and not ho- having it all done for you, and you just all you do is get in the back of the limo, and I think that's one of the keys to all that. You've been able to uh, now cope with the fact that you get on an airplane and. I do all that. I mean, yeah. I do yeah. all that on my own. I don't. Any one does it for me. And you know that everybody's looking at you. And yeah, they don't. But it, you, no, 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 no. It's the way of doing it all. Yeah. It's almost unconscious. Yeah, you have to stand in line at the check-in and stuff. And it, you do that? Huh? Yeah. No I'm kidding. I was, I was just wondering about that because I, I know how Sinatra's done it. You know, I, I mean, I can, do it, yeah. I can do it the other way. I can do it the other way. I mean, I do it all the yeah. time. There's certain yeah. situations I say, look, yeah. I just want to be met by the. Someone at the airport, and I want to be taken to the VIP room. Other situations, like yesterday, I didn't have a plane booked. I mean, I knew the planes go every hour, so I just go to the airport and just put the thing. I mean, there's nothing in it. There's no one at the airport. It wasn't particularly crowded. No one took any notice. No one asked my autograph. I just would dress down very much, and you don't make a fuss. And who's going to look at you? And if they do, well, they can ask for an autograph, and that's the end of that. So it, and it's good to do that, you see, because otherwise you're so aware. If you're surrounded with people looking after you, you're making much more fuss. And you're becoming so kind of like precious in yourself. And I think it helps to sort of get down and do stuff on your own. And it's really odd that the perception uh, that of you, that I may have or somebody else may have, is that you're the other 
the other side. The other way. There's an entourage. And yeah, well, that's funny because I never been the one with the entourage yeah. and so on. I never, I never like entourages. I mean, obviously, you have people that work for you, and when you're on the road, yes, you have to have people working yeah. for you. You know that it's like every minute it's something. You have an it's an entourage anyway. The whole thing. But I never, I never have people around me that aren't doing a specific job and getting paid to do a specific job. And if they, and they don't sort of sit around yesing and they don't sit around socialising unless they've been working for years and years and years and then we are all friends together. But they work and then they work and that's it. And I don't like having people around me who just... No, most rock stars have people around like that and movie stars. They just seem to just attract them. We, uh... Stallone moved on our beach. Uh, we have a house up in Trangus. And, yeah. And a lot of movie people moved there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's this Broad Beach Road. It's terrific street. Uh, but he had to come with guard dogs, with bodyguards, and he has absolutely screwed it all up. I mean, really? We are, we're trying to get him to sell the goddamn place now. I mean, you know, well, it's a drag because you know what that was like. That's like, you know, like I'm saying, it's nice to get away from. Yeah. Like Malibu was like that at some point. I yeah. know it became. But I mean, he. You go to the Malibu Beach and see, you know, really the security there was nil, to be honest. And you'd see everyone on the beach, yeah. and I think people like to be like that. i got uh, just some favourites of, of yours. Uh, how many, are any of the performances high spots that you could... Uh, that had to be a very key memory, too. Right? Yeah, it's like Brian died a week yeah. before, and, was, and it was a huge crowd. Um, any time when you felt you were lighting it up there on the stage, just more than any other time? Or? Wembley, 1981, 1982, um, was really good. Was that, that was that terrific, huh? That's yeah. I, the Garden was have been some fantastic shows at the Garden. Oh, is, it, is it New York that Sh pumps you a little bit? Yeah, Chicago, 1981, was very good also. Um... I mean, it's difficult when you go back sure. to, to single out an individual show in the 60s. I really, apart from the ones I've given you. How about records? Uh, any that are favourites now or you felt the best? I think Aftermath is a good album. You like Beggar's Banquet at one Beggar's time. Banquet's yeah. good. Sticky yeah. Fingers. Exile Maestro, I think, is overrated. Um, um, some Girls. Any favorite hassles that the, the Ed Sullivan show, the Palladium? Oh, yeah. That's, with you got them all down, anyway. <laughs> Any favorites? You've got them all. Now, all those are awful, aren't they? Horrible. Altamont. Altamont, of course. That was, that's uh, a classic yeah. hassle. Um, all the drug busts. Um, that's about it. When you reflect now, if you, you know, like sometimes a ball player says that. There was one period where they were at their best, if they could relive, you know, the, the ball looked like it was coming slower. Any period in the career so far uh, that was at the very best, a year? I think 1969 Tour of America was really excellent. No, it was marred a bit by Ultimate at the end, but even that had its sort of bizarre, you know, um, feelings. But that was a very hot tour for the band. And they would... We recorded some good songs as well in the middle of it and muscle shows. I think that band was extremely hot that year. Um, and everything was clean. And a new guitar player yeah. who had sort of new energy. Um, but everything was working. It was like a new, the sound system was like the first time there was sound system monitors. We even had like stage costumes. I can't remember when that happened. That was the fir almost the first time. What for a minute? I mean, everything seemed to work. You know, I was running through some of this literature, and, and with Brian, and at the same time, there was uh, we had Jimi Hendrix. Uh, I got the phone call about him, and I was, and and obvious was a tragedy. But it's something. It, I was thinking, it's amazing that so many got through that period. Uh, Rather than... Rather than they all died. Well, it would be yeah. awful if they'd all have died. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. No, it, it was very tough. Because yeah. Jerry Garcia is very sick right now. He took yeah. some kind of... He had some kind of reaction to uh, something a dentist gave him. Or something like that. But, God, but he, I, you know, I would lie to match <laughs> You believe that. Time, yeah. <laughs> so here he is. He's very sick. And, and I wonder, how did those... How did people get through it? You know, there was a... Well, it would be a very strong yeah. constitution. 
you had to be phenomenally strong to get through all that drinking and taking acid and working. And nobody knew what the effects of these no, drugs wasn't. were going to be in no, the no. long term. <laughs> no, no one, no one warned you. Yeah. I mean, everyone, most drugs were always sold as being wonderful, weren't they? Yeah. I mean, Freud thought cocaine was going to be wonderful, but people discovered about that. But they didn't really know about cocaine addiction until quite recently. I mean, with that amount of people no, taking yeah, it, yeah. people didn't say, well, look, yeah, you can take cocaine, it's really great, but it, what happened is this and this and this. No one actually knew when the war would warn you. And everybody was young and... The effects seemed to wear it. off. Yeah. I think maybe it's the, the only thing is when, when people get to age 40 and they, then they start telling what the real effects are. <laughs> you know? Dumb question, though. Anything that you would have done differently over the years, uh, the band? Or oh, loads something? of things, but I mean, uh, you can't, you it's can't really it, pointless yeah. talking yeah. about <laughs> well, it. I know that. <laughs> There's mistakes you made yeah. and so on. Um, yeah. Perhaps the band shouldn't have gone, left England, such they should have stayed here and, and worked out their money thing in another way. But money is very important. It's a, it was a big drag at that point to be broke and be a big band and have no money at all. In fact, to owe money. Um, that's maybe one thing. Where Perhaps they should have worked harder. Perhaps the band should never have taken drugs. <laughs> you know what I mean? What <laughs> ifs? What, what, what ifs there? What, uh, what do you see for yourself five years out? Or? From now? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. There's a lot of... I mean, I'd like to work a bit harder. And it's just kind of... I think that, you know, work comes in spurts and so on. I think that now... Me particularly, I can't really talk about what's going to happen to the Rolling Stones because I really don't yeah. know what I know, they I'm think. Not interested. Well, you know, it's interesting. I'm, 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 <laughs> I don't want to pry, but I'm saying I'm interested. What's it is interesting, interesting to me, but it's I don't quite know too. how it's going to work, you know. Yeah. But yeah. I dare say the Rolling Stones will work again, but I don't know quite in what level they're going to work at. But, but personally, I mean, I, I feel like I want to really work hard. I'm just disappointed that those yeah. <laughs> everything comes at this one. Yeah. Like I was saying to you about the movie thing. Pictures, so yeah. it, I, I want to do so, pictures, but I don't want. I think I'm still really should concentrate this bit on music because I can't. I can only do stage performing as I would want to really do it for another seven years. I can do it really well. Really I mean, I can really still, pump still do it. Yeah. Maybe seven years is too. Maybe only five. Who knows? I mean, I should feel very fit at the moment so you know you think you're just Superman so that's good anyway you know what I mean that's good to feel like that because you need that confidence so I should really concentrate a bit on that but I, I would like to do two or three pitches as well and um, I would like to be able to create another something else outside of show business as well for myself to be interested in but I don't quite know what that's yeah. going to be still love the music yeah I think that though you get older and I think that, that it starts to sound a little bit You've been there. Unless you can create something really for yourself that's that's new. I mean, my own music and stuff, I can still get a, really a buzz out of. It's hard to get a buzz out of other people's music now. Yeah. It's very rare. And you, you turn on the radio and it sounds like, oh, no. Yeah. Like, it, oh, you know where it's all come from and so on. And you say, oh, God, that sounds like Freddie and the Dreamers yeah. in 1963. There's this, ba this band called... Just the group of the week called the House Martins, and it's yeah. so awful. It's like Skiffle Group. And you think, oh God, how can this be? But so what? You've been there, so what? The, yeah. You don't want to listen to that crap. And it's hard to get excited about the, you know, um, you know how many records you sold or how many yeah. you didn't sell, and say, so, oh, fuck it, so what? You know, it was That's number the hardest one. thing. Isn't it it was number ten. It's yeah. very competitive. I think. I think that competitive edge has to be still there you have to say this is better than anything anyone else is doing right now and fuck you I think that that yeah. still has to be there which is in a way I'm a bit unfortunate because the music isn't uh, football but you know I think the next five years is going to be very full Terrific. good thank you well